Once upon a time, I was an ambitious young fella and a generalist. I was interested in everything. I went to Swarthmore, which encourages generalism. I resented having to major. So I majored in philosophy, which was the easiest. And I, uh, but I knew there was something lurking over the horizon. I, I, I thought there would be, I would find something that would be uh, the sword in the stone. Sorry to interrupt, when was this? Oh, um, I graduated in 59. 59, okay. And uh, I went to graduate school in sociology because I thought there was truth there I wanted and Swarthmore did not ha have sociology. And I got done with that. But my second year in graduate school at Harvard, I took a computer course. Now, I did not see a computer for four years after that. I didn't need to. Uh, as soon as I found out, well, I, I, I thought I was going to be a filmmaker. And uh, I'd made a, one film in college. And as soon as I saw you could put screens on, interactive screens on computers, I said, holy shit, that's it. The interactive screen will be the new home of the human race, and that was 1960. And nobody could understand a word I said. I tried to tell people all this. And the, the notion of interacting with a computer was very hard to explain. <clears throat> Do you remember what, what uh, specific model or make or whatever was the, the first one you remember seeing? There weren't a lot of things with screens. And As I say, I didn't see a computer for four years. I haunted a family place out in, in Hackettstown, uh, near Hackettstown. And uh, on the way from New York, I would stop at, oh heck, I can't remember the name of the town now, but it's where digital equipment had their New York headquarters. Ah, mm -hmm. Rather than spend the money on a New York office, they, if, if you really wanted to know about digital equipment, you had, you had to go to Parsippany, that was it. So David Deviston, De Deniston at Parsippany gave me a great deal of um, tutoring. Hmm. And <clears throat> you see, at that time, um, there was IBM, there was Univac, and uh, the so-called the so Seven Dwarves. Um, my first salary job, well, no, I'll, I'll skip over. I got a very nice job at Harcourt Brace and World Publishers, assistant to the president, and I was gonna try to persuade him to put in a graphical computer system, in fact, I had advance notice from Dave Denniston at EDEC that they would be having a PDP-8 based graphical, graphical system for only um, whatever. And, um, and he budgeted it. But I didn't understand one fundamental, two, two fundamental uh, facts. One is, in a big corporation, who is your enemy? Is it the Competition of that corporation? No, it's the other department. <laughs> and IBM, and, and Harcourt was an IBM shop. End of story. There was no way in hell that a computer from DEC was gonna go into that building. It, it took several, a couple of years to play out, but that's, that's how it worked. So there I was not knowing what to do next. And I don't know what I did next. <clears throat> I went out to see Doug Engelbart. Oh, I, I, should, I should say that by this time, I'd published a number of papers. In 65, I published, I submitted five papers to conferences, and they were all accepted. And I gave a talk at the 20th ACM National Conference in Cleveland. And I believe that most of the computer scientists in the world were in the room at that time. It was possible. Is that my drink or? 
Uh, we could probably get a proper one for I you. I thought I had one. Somebody else, somebody else had one. So, so, uh, so there was, there was a, uh, so there was vast applause for my talk. And the, the, the last slide said, change, change, change. We had to have, have, uh, have uh, changeable data structures and change it to, to, to match the remarkable aspects of the human mind, which goes in all directions. Well, computers didn't go in all directions. They, 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 uh, they already the, the notion of uh, hierarchical files was pretty thorough, pretty, pretty, pretty thoroughly ensconced. And so um, uh, that was, that became my fight. <clears throat> but because I was so concerned with the coming screens we were going to have, even though I didn't see a computer screen until 67, but I was designing for them. I think I, I went up to, um, anyway, one of, one of the, one of the, uh, uh, Corporations that thank you so much. Uh, one of the corporations that uh, does did did uh, thank you did word laws. I know my, uh, I know what I'm thinking. <laughs> <laughs> one of the company one of the companies that was 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 doing a command and control systems, and that, I went to uh, okay, I've forgotten the name of it. And that was the first time I actually saw a computer screen and held a light pen. We thought, I thought it would be light pens at that time. And uh, actually light guns where you'd have a, it'd be easy to hold. <laughs> Trigger, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Rather than a light pen where you had to diddle it. <laughs> and um, forget the name of the guy, but I wept because it was exactly the way I knew it would be. Although it was, I only cried on the side he couldn't see. <laughs> so anyway, I was trying, by this time, 66, I actually had a chance to visit Doug Engelbart's shop. This is two years before his great, I presume, is there anyone here who doesn't know about the great demo of Douglas Engelbart? Good. So where was he physically at the time? He was at a company called Stanford Research Institute, which had no connection with Stanford University. Mm -hmm. And he was getting a lot of money from <clears throat> ARPA, and in particular from the guy who later at Park, I can't think of his name right now, mm -hmm. uh, said, I don't know what I want, but I'll know it when I see it. <laughs> <clears throat> Pardon? Alan no, 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 no. He knew what he wanted before he saw it. <clears throat> um, anyway, let, this is very annoying. So, It was he who, after my talk at ACM, he asked me if I'd heard of Douglas Engelbart, and I said I hadn't, but I made a note, and I actually had a California trip that, where I got to see it. So this was two years before Doug's great demo, and he showed me all the stuff he was doing and kind of hinted at that, 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 that I could work for him, but uh, I could see that I wanted to do it differently. <laughs> and, uh, and uh, for all of you, just to, just to review, um, Douglas Engelbart was an amazing man, came from a state below Mount Washington. <laughs> Oregon. Oregon. He mil milked the cow in the morning. They had a cow. And he got his PhD in electrical engineering and he invented a number of things. He was very brilliant. And then he was in the Navy 
and they started out under the Golden Gate Bridge, and war and, and the news came that the war was over. And they say, hey, turn the ship around. Nope, nope, nope. So he went to the Philippines for a couple of years, and that was where he read the canonical article by Van Nevar Bush. Most people pronounce it Vannevar, but it was Van Nevar Bush, uh, As We May Think, which ran first in the Atlantic Monthly and then again in Life magazine. So in As We May Think, Bush imagined that you could have all the writings of the human race on microfilm in a desk. Woo woo! <laughs> that was many orders of magnitude ago. <clears throat> and the user would have a little camera mounted on his forehead. And when he saw something that was relevant, he would take a picture of it and connect it to something else. And he called these trails. And uh, <clears throat> this has been noted as one of the origins of hypertext. Of course, it turns out also that it was transclusion, but I wanted to get, to get into that. So <clears throat> I phoned Bush when I was in. Boston for a spring computer conference. And I told him I was working on his ideas, and he said he really wanted to talk to me, but he sounded like a phys ed instructor, and I didn't like him. And <laughs> so I never just phoned him back. Mid 60s again? Yes. That would that'd probably would be 66. Okay. <clears throat> so, anyway, I was designing for how a screen should look. And uh, nobody else was that I could think of, except the guy at, uh, at the uh, first place I saw the computer, the, the, the R&D for command and control, MITRE Corporation. And uh, they were designing it, but, but theirs were for command and control of nuclear weapons and submarines and stuff we don't want to talk about. And um, that wasn't, I wanted something for the humanists. Because as far as I was concerned, uh, uh, we wanted to get away from the hierarchical and rigid uh, structures imposed not by the computer, but by the conventions of the computer. So <clears throat> how do we get away from well, in that case, how much of it was dictated by the, the conventions of the computer versus the conventions of the group that was developing the stuff? I can imagine, you know, you develop software in the, the military, and you know, surprise, surprise, they have uh, uh, the structure of the organization somehow is reflected in the software and the design and so forth. Right, but 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 all the com all computers had had hierarchical directories, as far as I know. <clears throat> uh, oh, well. I guess you can, you can absolve the Lisp machine. I never could, I could never understand Lisp. <laughs> and, and, uh, it just had a mess. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it had pointers at pointers at pointers at things. And uh, I, didn't, I couldn't figure out where the program was. And, it was uh, in the pointers. Yeah. No, it was, it, it, was, it was pointed at by the pointers. Right, right. Mm -hmm. It was pointers all the way down. Yes. And, uh, No one knows the origin of that phrase. It is, it is always attributed to the, uh, to the leading intellectual of the day. So it's been, uh, turtles all the way down has been attributed to Einstein. Well, I, I assume it was misquotes all the way down as well. Probably. <laughs> so uh, I think it, it may first have appeared in, in uh, 19th century psychologist, what's his name? All right, anyway. Boy, am I, am I missing on my words? So. Right, so hierarchical uh, uh, file systems that have command and control. Yeah. So, but, but, but 
ob it was obvious that personal computers were going to come. Now, nobody could, uh, everyone I told this to thought I was delirious. And, uh, and uh, it wasn't until the Altair ad, what was it, November 1974 of Popular Electronics, I think, or December. It's around there, yeah. Announcing the Altair computer. At last, a computer you can build yourself for only $400. And what had not been anticipated, except I think by me, was the avalanche of excitement it, it caused. Uh, Ed Roberts, who founded the company, figured that he could save his company if he got 500 orders for this thing. And 500 orders came in the first day. And it, this, was, this is rather like uh, the Apple One, which my book inspired. And, and, uh, and uh, Jobs said to Was, well, maybe we could sell 50 of them. And they went down to Paul Terrell's bite shop on El Camino. And Paul said, sure, I'll take 50. And uh, they founded Apple. Mm -hmm. So with something like the Altair, there were computers that were vastly more powerful and easy to use and well, so forth well, at the time, but well, the, not at the price. Well, the, the, the Altair was just a, just a row of blinking lights. They, did, well, they, they had switches, too. Yeah, <laughs> but the point is that, that, it, that it, it, to make a, a functioning computer would take much more than yeah, yeah. whatever it was, $800, $400. Mm -hmm. But people did it. People did it. Yeah. I actually started uh, advertised for friends, for, for Partners to start a computer co store in Evanston, Illinois. Where I happened to be in Chicago, and, and uh, we founded the Itty Bitty Machine Company, which had long been a parody name for IBM. And, uh, and uh, it was quite successful for a little while, but... Hmm. What, what year was that? I think it will have been 75. Ah, okay. Wait, wait a minute. Yeah, 74 was, I think, the... the, the oh, okay. Oh, that's too bad. I was in Evanston until 73. Interesting. Yeah. Right. Well, this was in Evanston. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and uh, it was amazing how people would, 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 would buy these things with no real use for them. And so people would step into the, step into the, uh, into the breach with a basic. There was... A basic for, I, I won't try to sort the basics out. I did, I, I did go to the first World Altair Computer Conference, hmm. and in my notes, it said, this guy, Roberts, looks like an asshole, but the kid from Harvard seems bright. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, so anyway, the, uh, oh, just my last, I'll throw it in here. The last time I ran into Bill Gates, the last thing he said, I just, he, he was, I, I had just given a talk and he was about to give his talk. And he said, oh, I get it, Xanadu is a server. And, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> anyway. Um, so that, I've started so many uh, threads here. So it's itty bitty uh, uh, machine company. Yeah. Well, that 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 ran its course, hmm. as as so many of these things did. We 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 sold the processor technology came on and made a better version of the of the Altair. Oh yeah. And uh, and you and you could buy memory boards, and I I, I did a very nice uh, catalog for them, which saw, showed the current offerings, and on the other side was a was a uh, painting I'd done of computers arise, and it showed this enchained computer rising as the chains are broken. Oh, you can, by the way, a fellow named James Risberg is selling Nelswag at nelswag.com so that you can still get <laughs> computer lib now a hundred bucks, and 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 uh, and this this painting, and so on. For that. So, what did the change symbolize? Was it was it price, performance, memory? 
yes. software. Okay. <coughs> well, we always thought the software would be the easy part. <laughs> now, I'm very proud of what I did in 60, 70, 70, 71. Um, it was possible to get an absurd machine with mass memory for $10,000. Hmm. It was a Okay, I've forgotten the name of the... the uh... So, not DEC, not Data General, data not... General, thank you. Data General, okay. Very good. Mm -hmm. With Data General, you had to toggle in the bootstraps, bootstrap in order to load the loader, which would then load the program. But this was then available with, for $10,000 with a cassette drive. And I jumped on it, and I said, okay, I'm going to make a word processor. And I had a wonderful collaborator named Cal Daniels who worked for the company that was selling this deal, so he knew it intimately. And in the course of designing it, okay, here, here, here were the idiotic specs. I said, I want you to be able to edit War and Peace on this cassette drive. Hmm. And... Our are we talking audio cassette or, or something a little bit more mature? We're talking about a Philips cassette drive that was illegally adapted with, I think, some kind <laughs> of a cut in it uh, for use as in mass. Ah, uh, okay. Cut. But I invented in the course of this an excellent input program, which I call Jot or Juggler of Text, and you can enact it now on the Internet Archive. It, and a data structure which would manage all this stuff. You see, the attitude of a word, pro a word processor gurus in the early days was, we'll just bring the text, you know, it, it, Text is, is, is such, such a simple matter. We'll just bring the text into, into memory and, and fiddle it with it there and put it out again. No. So the point was that all new text would be appended to the tape. Mm -hmm. And I worked out a data structure called an enfilade from the French, from, from the French enfilade, meaning in a file. And it's a pun because it means also shooting at a row of soldiers straight down the row which means that you get extra, extra bang for the buck. And uh, so the enfilade was data structure that would manage all the pieces of the document without having to move them on disk, on the tape. And as you rearranged and inserted and deleted and added. Mm -hmm. Inserted and deleted. And so, and, and so the amazing thing, well, in my autobiography, Possiplex, I have the quotes from two guys who reprogrammed Jot. And I had said, it's going to feel creamy smooth, because all you do, you see, is space means step. And if you're in word mode, you step with word. If you're in sentence mode, you step, you step a sentence. Mm -hmm. If you're in paragraph mode, you step, you step a paragraph. Now, and you, you're, you had arrow keys. This was on the 33 ASR, by the way. So, and so you, with your arrow, you can go back to the previous, to the greater, uh, you can go from paragraph mode up to, from sentence mode up to paragraph mode. And both Mark Miller and um, Jonathan Post reprogrammed this and were astounded that it felt just as good as I said it was. 
uh, as it would. So I, I contend that I have one, one ability, which is to know how my interfaces will feel beforehand, which it, it is generally said you don't. Mm -hmm. Okay, so where were we? <coughs> so anyway, this, the, um, I had a backer and he put in the first $5,000, but then not the second $5,000, so we couldn't buy the thing, so the whole project collapsed. Mm -hmm. But after it was designed and programmed, so as far as I know that that program would have worked, it's, it's an Algol. <laughs> because Algol would fit on the data general. That's actually pretty impressive for, for 71 for $10,000 to have, be able to code an Algol. And do uh, you remember how much memory the machine would have had? 8K? Yeah, okay. Something like yeah, that. Yeah, yeah. War, war and Peace is a little bit bigger, though. I know. <clears throat> so the guy who was backing Douglas Engelbart, Taylor, Bob Taylor. Hmm. All right, so it was Bob Taylor who at Xerox Park says, I don't know what I want, but I'll know it when I see it. And they gave us the, the so-called modern GUI, which I insist on calling the PUI, or Park User Interface. Because what did it do? Took away the right to program, and it reduced all text to a single column. All text, all text systems that are out there now are a single column. Go to books printed as late as the middle of the 20th century. You will see layouts of parallel columns from the earliest, from, from, from before Christ, you know, there, they had parallel columns which were a part of the document. It was a legitimate document to have parallel linked texts, which have now been forbidden by those holy guys. So the thing is that, 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 that what's his name, got so much money and, and, and Praise for creating Microsoft Word, and uh, Simone. Yeah, yeah, and 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 some similarly for the guy who got so much money and praise for creating. Uh, uh, PDF, hmm. but nobody notices what they've taken away. They've taken away half of civilization. Hmm. So. We are looking at a world of single column text and no way to fix it. I'm, I mean, I've, 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 I've tried everything. I've made speeches, I've put up videos and so forth and so on. I've come up with data structures, data structures involving, well, <coughs> well. So, so to be clear, you're referring not to multi-column text like you'd find in newspapers but multi-column text like you'd find in very old books where you've got the main text and then uh, uh, comments and further information and so forth off to the side. Is yeah, that what not, you mean? Not, not, not that old either. Okay, yeah, yeah. So that the option of having documents, articles, books with side-by-side -side text has been denied us and they don't know they've done it. That's, that's, that, that, to me, is the worst part of it. And uh, now, my Xanadu project, it got that name while I was at Harcourt, not knowing that uh, the Harcourt project was doomed because they wouldn't take an, a, you couldn't put a, bring a, a deck computer into a, an IBM shop. But I started calling it Xanadu from that date. And, it was a bunch of disconnected objectives, among them parallel text, until the summer of 1979, when I got together my dream team, uh, Roger, Gre Re Roger Gregory, Mark Miller, Stuart King, Eric Hill, uh, Roland King, Stuart Green, Eric Hill, and Roland King. <coughs> And we spent the summer of 79 designing it. Now, this, this was before 
there was a unifying address space for the internet. So we created our own. Mm -hmm. And <clears throat> and a data structure based on multiple enfilades, the cleverest being the poom fillade or permuted, permuted order of matrices. So you had the rearrangements were handled by permutation matrices, a permutation matrix enfilade. All this starting with my original enfilade, which unfortunately no one has mathematically defined well enough. I, I can't. <laughs> And uh, so that was in 79, and it was denominated XU88 with the expectation that it would take nine years to program. A very, very good estimate that Roger made. So Roger continued working on it all those, uh, the others, others drifted <laughs> off. In fact, <coughs> I got. I, I edited a creative computing magazine for a while, and then, uh, then uh, I went to Data Point in Texas as their new chief interaction designer, and that was great until Data Point went under. <laughs> Not because of my, me, because uh, the, it never got out the door. <clears throat> had they done terminals and it switched into something else, or? <laughs> what they had done was created a computer that was called an input device because <clears throat> they recognized the, 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 in fact, the founder who was killed in an automobile accident wanted, wanted it to be a computer. And so they, uh, made one and they denominated a, 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 an input device with two little, with a cassette tape, I think it was. And that came out in 1970. And only one person treated it as a computer, and that was Klaus Landberg in Denmark. And so he came over as vice president to create an operating system for it, before he created one operating system and then, then another. <clears throat> and that was, uh, it was really great, but um, unfortunately they were, they, they were doing the wrong thing. They were crediting salesmen with a sale when the salesman had just made a placement on, uh, uh, on uh, 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 a, a, what, a sheet or something, a, a scoreboard. Uh, yeah, a score, a scoreboard. Yeah. What, what, what was it called when, when they sent you a bunch of stamps? On approval, yes. Uh. So they sent you, they, they, they put these out on approval and so they, they were, company was logging completely false sales <laughs> and that uh, that ah, okay so a normal Silicon Valley company it sounds like although well, they weren't there it, it norm, not normal in the sense that it went under mm. <laughs> so <clears throat> but the Intel architecture starting with the 8008 was designed by Harry Pyle and Vic Poor, Harry Pyle was a high school student. Vic Poor was a uh, was a uh, an engineer, and they they connected over CB radio and got together and designed this <laughs> architecture, and this this character, this uh, <clears throat> instruction set. And then they made a deal with Intel, and in Intel would make a chip. And then Intel came up with something, and they said, "Oh, we don't want that." And uh, broke the contract with Intel, whereupon Intel brought out the real chip they'd been hiding. <laughs> right. And uh, anyway, so, uh, so that was, so, so Harry and Vic designed the current architecture. Of course, the real architecture, if any of you, everybody ought to know this. In England, a guy named C-A-R Hoar, H-O-A-R-E, created the Occam language, which was designed to be So it's parallel, it's communication based. Not just that. 
but also um, uh, proof against hacking. <laughs> and they, that went through several iterations and was rescued a couple of times by the English government, but it was not, it was not, it, it, it didn't make it. And it, it's very, mm -hmm. if it had, we might have had a very different computer world today. Okay, so I was wandering around. <coughs> oh yeah, so so uh, Bob Taylor at uh, at Xerox Park said, "This is what I want," and now we're all stuck with a simulation of paper. <laughs> what what they, they 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 labored and they created a paper simulator, which to me is like tearing the wings off a 747 and driving it on a highway as a bus. I think they did that in a movie, I remember. I don't think it was a 747, but it was another aircraft. So, um, I don't, I, I, I know what I would do if I had the time and the, uh, and the, uh, energy and the optimism, I would still try to create a form of literature based upon pages which could be connected. And you can see those if you, if you go to, if you go to, uh, I've got one video called Xanadu Basics 1A. And you can, you can get to that from anywhere. You don't need to look it up. You can just go to get to that from, You just find that on Google, I assume. Google. Yep. <laughs> and uh, so Xanadu Basics 1A gives you, gives you uh, a, uh, a, a rousing talk on what we don't have and what we should. Xanadu Basics 2 shows all the prototypes that my teams and I have created. And... Uh, they are, uh, some of them, quite beautiful. But where to go when the whole world is going the wrong way? I don't know. <laughs> well, but we've got bits of your vision now. Yeah. As, you, as you point out, so many of them are broken. Well, well bits, yeah. Uh, no, I mean, you know, 50 years from now, someone will say, oh, Nelson was right. What do you know? <laughs> yeah. Or, or, or <clears throat> they're reinventing things, but. Uh, that's, that's part of the job. Yes. So I'm, I'm soggier this morning than I intended to be. <laughs> <laughs> That's so one I'm one not, thing that I'm not a morning person, and I had to get up for a ten o'clock car. Mm. So uh, something that occurred to me when, when reading through your things. So always, so you've got these visions of what things might be able to do, and the problem is, is that we have technology at the moment, and what technology of the future might be, and so forth. Uh, and. Uh, I see a lot of things like hierarchical file systems and so forth, some sort of strange compromise between uh, Nirvana and uh, t what the, the technology is able to produce. You know, do, you, do you still see a lot well, of that? There's no, there's no compromising with it. It's, it's, it's an iron boot. Hmm. It's, a, it's an iron boot. On the, on the neck of the human race. Hmm. We, do, we do not, we cannot write. Now, for example, this you'll like. Um, 50 years ago, the great author, Vladimir Nabokov, created a hypertext novel. It was called Pale Fire. And it consisted of a beautiful poem by the fictitious poet John Shade, and truly a beautiful poem about 
the suicide of his daughter, about 900 lines, I think, with footnotes by a jackass named Charles Kinboat. And so here is Nabokov playing a prank, as usual, writing something really beautiful, and then messing it up with these footnotes. So I wrote to the publishers of Pale Fire 50 years ago, 19, anyway, 50 years ago, <clears throat> saying, could we use this to demonstrate the, uh, the uh, system that I'd done at Brown with Van Damme? The first, it was the first system where you could click on a highlighted piece of text and jump to something else. So I, I, <coughs> I realized I did, hyper, I did invent hypertext. I didn't realize it. I thought I'd just given it a name. But, but that was the first. But, but I, he, he had another. He, he, did, he did another kind of link, and not to be outdone. But the links that highlighted a piece of text, which then clicked, jumped you to somewhere else, that was in the HES system at Brown University. And to demonstrate this, I was being gung-ho. There was talk of demonstrating it at the IBM Pavilion at the Spring Joint Computer Conference. So I wrote to the publisher of Pale Fire and got permission to use Nabokov's book. Well, 50 years later, that demo now exists. <laughs> and it's at xanadu.com slash demo, and I strongly advise that you look at it. It is parallel pages, visibly connected, with very nice, uh, very nice um, links between them that come and go, depending on what you do with your, with your mouse. So I, I, I sent to the current publishers of Fire, announcing this triumph. It's now owned by Penguin and got nothing in response. <laughs> I'm sure they didn't know what to make of it. I'm sure they didn't look at it. I'm sure the people you communicated with originally are long gone. Very likely, as is Nabokov. Mm -hmm. So um, that, to me, is my best demo of parallel pages visibly connected. And as a, and, but there have been many demos and many, and many data structures proposed. So a question I have, I, I find this, uh, even when I'm reading uh, uh, print that has footnotes and things like that, uh, how am I to consume it? What, what order would you recommend for these things? Obviously, I have many choices. Um, but uh, you know, one of the things I find really annoying reading a, a paper with footnotes is I feel compelled to read the footnotes. Oh, there might be something important there, and then I read the footnotes. No, there isn't something important there, but maybe in the next one. Well, <laughs> when confronted with a choice, Two roads converge in a wood, and I, I took the one less traveled by, and that has made all the difference. So, you know, you see two things side by side that are intrinsically one literary object. Do with it what you will. <laughs> so we got to have, uh, uh, like, uh, what is reader's choice, he said. Yep. So you think we should have like a number of times this has been followed versus number of times this has followed to find out which is the path less, least traveled? Uh, I, I, I'm not into social media or determining the numbers of things that happen. Well, you just told us to take the path less traveled, right? So we need to know no, travel numbers. No, I, I gave that as an instance. Ah, okay. I didn't tell you to do it. <laughs> so it made the difference. This I believe, this I believe. I just heard that, that, that Frost had been writing and writing on some great 
piece, and then instead he just wrote that. <laughs> so the creative process is remains as mysterious as ever. I can believe this. I, uh, what Howard Rheingold used to say, I get my best ideas from, me, from misunderstanding Ted. <laughs> I, I, he never expressed any to me, so I don't know. So can you think of any, any modern system, software, hardware, or whatever that's actually mildly impressed you or done anything but engender complete disgust? Well, not so much disgust. Depression. Mm. Uh, I mean, we do have you know some noticeable fraction of the world's knowledge uh, you know at our at our fingertips here, and you know we've discovered that over the last few years it doesn't seem to help much, but. Uh, you know, it's it's easier to look up uh, you know manuals for data general computers from 1971 than it ever was. Yeah. And and <clears throat> asking ill-formed questions of Google is 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 a uh, is always a temptation. I do it ten times a day. Right, right. How to how to convert to Catholicism? How to convert to PDF? That sort of thing. Yeah. <laughs> no. Which of those requires the most faith? <laughs> I would argue there are more versions of Catholicism than PDF, but it's a close race. Well, Simone, first he created his language for the... You see, Park always thought they were building a paper simulator. WYSIWYG, what you see is what you get, which, may, which parsed correctly means, what you see on the screen is what you get when you print, print it, it out. out. Yeah. So we have, in this, in this union, we have m created the computer as a paper simulator. Pardon? It's framed our thinking. Yes, it has. <clears throat> yeah, Bob Taylor said to me, well, paper has wide acceptance. <laughs> but it's, it's been around for a while. Yeah, but, but the point is that... that uh, yeah, no, I, I agree with you on this one. I think it's, uh, but I think it's uh, a misnomer. I think it's whizzy neck. Uh, what you see is not even close. <laughs> even when you print it out, well, I. I can think of one case where it actually was WYSIWYG, and that was uh, the first Macintosh, and that's because they had really low resolution dot matrix printers, so the crappy stuff you saw on the screen would be the same crap you'd see on the, uh, on the printout, and we've moved beyond that, but. Uh, they had something on the first Macintosh I really liked, <clears throat> and you can't get it anymore. You could fold, I think it was, I think it's Mac Draw, where you could, you could put all kinds of text in the Mac draw and fold it so, so it had sections. It, it was kind of like an outliner. I used it a lot, and of course, it oh, doesn't work anymore. Yeah, yeah. Oh, and I was going to uh, point out as well with the first Macintosh, they, uh, the floppies it was actually a flat file system. So uh, they did have folders, but it was really interesting. When you said open a file, it actually gave you all the stuff on the floppy. But because there was only 400 kilobytes on the floppy, this was not that big. I didn't follow that at all. Um, so you were complaining about hierarchical file systems. Uh, the first Mac did not have a hierarchical file system. It was, it was flat. They had folders where you could go looking, and they would show you only some of the, the files. But if you said open a file, it would show you all the junk on the disk, including the stuff that wasn't in, in folders. It didn't last too long. Yeah, yeah, folders were, well, folders were annotations. They would say, oh, just look at these files, not this other stuff. But now a folder is a hierarchical directory. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. When <clears throat> 
Bob Taylor, when he first spoke to me at the 1965 ACM conference, asked if I'd heard of Douglas Engelbart, and that, at that time he was supporting Engelbart to the hilt. And then, at some point, he pulled out the he pulled out the he pulled out the um, rug, and le Doug was left to wander alone, unsupported for forty years. Now, I guess that was because this was Defense Department money, right? Yes, but it was very much the discretionary money of Bob Taylor. Yeah. And, in fact, can't think of his name right now. Oh, by the way, the other, one of my other pet peeves, and this is a small one, cut and paste. Mm -hmm. When I was a boy and learned to write, cut and paste meant Okay, writing is mostly rewriting. I go, I go through many versions. And cut and paste meant you would cut it up and rearrange it on the bed, on the floor. My grandmother went to a lecture by one of Tolstoy's daughters. And the way Tolstoy did, <clears throat> he would di dictate a new version to two daughters who would write it out identically. One was kept for reference and the other was cut up and left all over the dacha, Yasnaya Poliana, and, and uh, he would go into the woods and call back, don't touch my noodles. So I call them noodles in honor of Tolstoy. And my good friend, well, of course I forgot his name at this moment, who just died, he changed the words cut and paste to mean hide and plug. So we no longer have a tool that allows you to do complex rearrangement. There is one word processor, uh, I forget the name of it, which has a multi a, 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 such a feature, <clears throat> but it's, uh, it's a rarity. And I could never, <clears throat> I could never in my, <clears throat> we must have exchanged hundreds of emails about it, where he, he said, well, that's just for, for specialty operations. No, it wasn't. My first salary job was at my hometown newspaper, the New York Times, and I was a, um, <clears throat> I was a copy boy. And my first task in the morning was to fill the paste pots. <laughs> and the paste pot was about this big in diameter and had a tube done, it was annular. <coughs> and the, <coughs> sorry, the cap had a brush sticking down that would go down the tube. So in the, first, in the morning, I would pick up five or six of these paste pots from the different desks. They, they were arranged in a sort of a symphonic set of curved desks. I forget, city desk foreign desk, I don't remember. In any case, I would scrape out the old dried paste, shake it out, and go to a luminous vat, a golden aluminum vat of luminous, fresh goo, fresh paste, which I would put in the, inside the annular uh, frame of the paste pots, and then I would put them on the city desk and the foreign desk, and that would be my job. Then, then I would hang around until somebody said, <coughs> and, the, and, the, and, the, and the writer would come in, type, a, type a, an article. He would then cut it. He would then paste it. And he would write a little few more things until it was satisfactory. He would say copy, and I'd run over and put it in the, uh, in a, in the, the pneumatic tube and send it up to type something. But that's what, but, but it wasn't just for long articles, it was for short articles. Cut and paste was, and remains for me, a universal tool of writing. But we have lost that. 
we have that, that has been taken away from us. And moreover, by this, um, by this linguistic trick made to seem as though we haven't lost anything. So I still, on a long, on a long piece, I will print it out, cut it up, rearrange it. I use, I use staples and I use the out, you know, a staple has an anvil and the anvil has two settings, one that pushes the, the, the staples in and the other that pushes them out. So if you, the outsy staples are easy to remove. So I use outsy stapling for my, for my true cut and paste. But that is, but, but it, it, it. What, what are the atomic units you use for the, the noodles? Atomic the, units? Are they words? Are they sentences? Yes. I'm sure they can be all of the above. Yeah. Okay. Chunks. Okay. Do you often find yourself cutting smaller noodles, big noodles into smaller noodles and moving those around? Yes. Okay. And I'll, I'll have a, a, a hyper noodle that's got several layers. I haven't done this lately because I'm <coughs> only writing emails mostly. <laughs> but yeah, the, 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 the current state of the, of the world, of the computer world appalls me because everyone thinks text is one, <laughs> one column and everyone, and, and my friend Frode Hegland is he holds seminars on the future of text, the future of this one column. I don't get it. And, uh, <clears throat> and, there's, and, and we don't have decent writing tools, and we don't have ways of supporting multi-sectioned text. Now, I, I just found a site I don't remember the name of it, but it is for the, it, it, it is the authority site for all the different Greek versions of the Iliad, I believe. Hmm. Now the Iliad, I have, I have to digress. A man named Milman Parry in the early 20th century changed the notion of Iliad, Iliad studies because he said there wasn't a Homer. These were recitations and the wine dark sea was, was you'd put at the end of a sentence for the rhythm or, <clears throat> and, uh, or the, the, the beautiful sea at the beginning of a sentence for the rhythm. But these were forms of recitation used throughout the world to preserve the way we think prior to writing, to, to preserve tradition. His name was Milman Parry, M-I-L-M-A-N Parry. Apparently he committed suicide at the age of 23 when he didn't get tenure at Harvard, but this was after he had just gone to the Balkans and recorded similar rhetor rhetorical rhythmic right, uh, recitations of similar stuff from, from those other cultures. So in other words, Probably the fundamental pre-literate form of preserving knowledge was chanting, rhythmic chanting. And Parry, <coughs> Parry had re recorded it, Parry, Parry spotted it for, for Homer, and there never was a Homer. <coughs> But, but rather those were the chants. And then he, then he did it for the, in the Balkans. So this, is, this absolutely fascinated me. I forget where, it, so, that, so that, that's what we had before writing. Now we have writing and, we, and for 
For many years, we had books which could be laid out any which way you like, and now they can't be laid out any which way anymore, unless you do it with glue. Because <laughs> there's no, there's no, uh, there, there, there are no decent tools. How long can I talk, or should we stop? <laughs> I once, I once. Uh, <clears throat> Let's see. So I think we officially have uh, uh, time until two. Jeff, are you out there? Okay. So uh, not, yeah, maybe this would be a good time to uh, oh, to they stop. Used, they used to ask me, "How long do you want to talk?" <clears throat> and I said, uh, what, 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 "Oh." You can, oh, people would say to me, you can talk as long as you like, and I'd say, really? And they would say, within reason. <laughs> and I would say, which is it? <laughs> so, but this but is, I, I don't have the eight hour in me. This is the beauty of the English language. You can say things without actually saying things. I'm within not, reason. I'm not sure that that's unique to English. <laughs> not, not being... So, okay, it's perhaps unique to spoken language. Okay, yes, do we have some uh, questions? That'd be great. So, Ted, um, I want to first thank you for communicating your ideas very thoroughly that we can dig, dig, dig deep into them and take them forward and teach them to people. Um, my question is, is it possible to prioritize your innovations in terms of what we should work on first, or bring forward, or you need them all at once? I, I have no idea, because yeah. <clears throat> I don't know what to do. <clears throat> what, uh, again, uh, please go to xanadocom slash demo and yeah. play with that. Yeah, I do have an exhibit with your demos running, so if anybody wants to come and see oh. it. Yep. Thank Excellent. You. So you talked about how the change of the term cut and paste has made it, you don't like that for your composition process. I find when I'm writing, I tend to be writing in one window and then moving chunks into a separate, like flat text editor to get things the way I want and then move it back into the main window. I guess I'm trying to wrap my head around the, how that mechanism doesn't fit your workflow. Uh, you haven't described it the way I, I quite get. <clears throat> My workflow is to, first of all, try to get everything down that I want to say. And that, and, and that means never mind the order. Now, how do we deal with the order? Well, if you're, if you're doing something itty-bitty that, that fits on one page, uh, maybe you can do that without cutting a page and just rearranging. But if it's if it's if it's like seven or eight pages, I print it out and cut it, paste it. it means means that I there are two sheets: the, the backing sheets that I, I paste it to, or the and 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 the and the little pieces that hang off it, and then I rearrange them accordingly and uh, uh, writing into the into it. And that is the process as it had been used for thousands of years. No, probably Shakespeare didn't do it. <laughs> but but uh, I'm sure that I'm sure that uh, many of our classes, many classicists, and 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 uh, and uh, people from the Enlightenment did it. But we don't. They don't say those. But I but I but I do have the Tolstoy. For my grandmother's anecdote. Hi, thank you. Uh, I wanted to know, um, like, in the process of identifying hypermedia in particular, were there any specific works that you are able to remember that kind of led you to? Viewing content as being more inter interlinking in general, um, like any, like literature, or was there there anything sort of like that? No, it was more that when I saw the computer, I said, 
holy smoke, now it doesn't have to be all in one sequence anymore. Right. <laughs> right. But, that was, but that, that was my urge from the beginning. Now, if you look at I, the magazines, I, the zines I published as, a, as, a, uh, as an undergraduate, there were, there were they are, they are quite um, hyper. <laughs> Thank you. Sir, uh, two things. The first, I would generally agree with you that um, with Homer, it's more of recitation and oration. Um, Seamus Haney had taken upon himself to go back to Beowulf and translate it more into the um, camber of, of modern English speech, which makes it A, more accessible, but B, with his poetic background, he was able to flow the story so that you heard the tone, saw the tone of the story, which was also communicated, again, in the oral tradition through oration, through presentation, through pregnant pauses so on and so forth. Um, so that's another example. If somebody wants to take a look, you can say uh, Seamus Haney put out a side by side with his translation on one side and the original Beowulf, or as close to original as you could get, on the other. And you could follow along and you can compare and contrast and understand how do we go from this manner of speaking to this manner of speaking, and how do you convey those ideas to a modern audience with modern oration? So, so, so you're right. Trans, side by side translation. I didn't even didn't even think of that. And what and what you're describing is obviously a, a, a noble enterprise where he where he's trying to preserve the qualities of the original in a way that we can appreciate. And the second, please correct me if I'm wrong. I think one of the, the points you're talking about, single column, goes to a tunnel vision of text. Thank you. Straight down one set of ideas. Um, I think the way I best understand it is when you copy and paste, when you cut all of your pieces, you put subject F down, then subject Z, then subject Q, then subject R, then subject A, then subject D. And when you're able to cut and paste them and put them out and lay them out, you're now able to see the possibly not obvious interconnections between your first set of ideas, your second, your third, and then with that removed perspective, seeing it all laid bare, you're now better able to understand the subject and the flow as you want to finally present it to the user. Whereas with the single column, you start at A and end at Z, and there's less of a way to see all of the, the myriad pieces that connect in through a subject. I would like to hire you as my explainer. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. Thank you again very much. Sir. Hi. Um, me and my dad, and also my mom, have been um, watching your YouTube videos. And oh. he's a computer scientist. He's the computer guy who understands everything that's, you know, being exhibited here, but I'm in sort of your position, and through hearing you talk about your career, I'm kind of put in that generalist, I don't know a thing about coding, but I'm, I, I know a little bit about it, and I'm able to slightly understand it, and we've been discussing your ideas, uh, and their understanding the, how Xanadu goes together has been a very difficult but rewarding process. and. Um, we were workshopping this question last night, and I think the only way I can get it out is, is to there work any... I don't know the verb to workshop. Oh, really? Oh, it's just to kind of brainstorm uh, basically what you're talking about, uh, the story about cutting and pasting and your, your paste pots and laying them all out, like you were talking about. Um, is there any advice, looking back on your career and all the times you've explained Xanadu and uh, to communicate the parts and the uh, paradigms within it. Is there any advice you might give yourself or someone looking to start a project or communicate a similar large idea or any sort of paradigm shifting 
were a possibly world-changing uh, uh, information program project uh, that would that you have learned how to more effectively communicate it or um, kind of get your idea out there. Is there any advice you might give your younger self or someone in their position? Well, I could caution myself against particular mistakes that I made, but that's um, broad. <laughs> right. I mean, you, you, you're saying, what about what about the next generation? If if you are that next generation with new ideas, good luck, <laughs> and and and. Uh, um, <clears throat> don't expect it to be easy. Because it's easy if you, if you uh, go along with the way things are. <coughs> also, reading a few pieces in the New Yorker recently that about uh, horrible work environments where you had to uh, agree with the boss. Um, <coughs> uh, you don't want to be in that situation. And how, how to avoid it is not to be in a work environment. You have to be on your own, and that's very difficult. But that was always my choice. And until magically, Autodesk bought the Xanadu project in 1988. And if I hadn't screwed up, we would have delivered in, in 88. Pardon me. Autodesk bought us in 1986 or so. And if, if I hadn't screwed up, we would have delivered in 88. So the important thing is don't screw up. <laughs> <laughs> I'll try not to. Thank you. Hi. Do you have some, do you have like a demo or recommend some kind of demonstration that demonstrates the sort of development, the writing development environment that you would like, like ideally, even if it isn't computer based, even if it's a a visual demo that you could refer to. It's well, kind of what you would wish for. If you go to the Internet Archive, I have a number of uh, cut and paste examples there. <coughs> Some <coughs> one is extremely hmm. I used to have pages cut for me at the paper company that were eleven inches wide and I think. 30 inches long, which I was using for my cut and paste. And I also had cardboard, which was stapled at the edges, but it had grooves that you could put these chunks into in any order. And all that got caught when the sewers rose in Cambridge, Massachusetts. And you can see those in the Internet Archive. I've never bothered to try to type them up. It's, re it's readable, but I've written, I've written so many books. <clears throat> I've, I've published nine books, but the number of book-length things I've written is uncounted. Probably another dozen, at least. And a kind of related, you know, do you, do you think that computers can be, ide you know, ideally, as good a tool as paper? I mean, for what you could do with cutting and pasting and development. Well, of course. Yeah. <clears throat> that would be if I had a, if I had a team and, and the energy. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you for asking that. I'm just snooping across the aisle here, and this gentleman is looking at, I believe, your book. I, I'm, I'm trying to remember the name of the of the of the one word processor that has Scrivener. Scrivener, Scrivener yes. has has a way that you can put pieces around in, a, in, a, in an area, so that. So there, there, there is one cut and paste. 
I looked at it and I didn't, it, it looked too busy, it looked, looked too complicated to get into for me. I'm looking across the aisle here at Possiplex, and huh? I can't read it because my eyesight isn't that good. <laughs> but I see different fonts, but I only see one column. Yeah. Why? Because that's the only way you can make it. <laughs> I did it in Microsoft Word. Oh my God. <laughs> <laughs> and, <laughs> and I use different I use different fonts. For the, and different headlines for the different threads of the story. So you emulated what you wanted using the tools available. Well, no, I didn't emulate it. I did it. Good. <laughs> I did what I could given that, yes. So, it, so um, I'm, I'm very pleased with the way the story tells itself by heading and by font rather than in an ordinary text. You have to pick up and say, now as we were saying back there, what this gives you extra clues. Hi, Ted. So your 1986 rewrite of Jot is on the Internet Archive. Yeah. I was able to reverse engineer the fourth source code from it, and I'd like to present you with the first page <laughs> of 100 pages of source code. Oh. <laughs> Well, thank you so much. You're welcome. <laughs> you, you, you disassembled Jot. Yeah. Did, did you try to use it? Did you find it easy to use? Yeah, I like using it uh, for navigation to sentences and paragraphs and the automatic capitalization of the first the word of a sentence. That took quite a, that took quite a flow chart, you bet your ass. Yeah, I saw it. Uh, the, uh, I had to invent a... notation, which I call lollipop notation, which turned out to be not just a state machine, but a mealy machine, M-E-A-L-Y. Well, here's what it was. You draw a lollipop, mm -hmm. and in the middle of the circle, you put the letter that is just received. Now, on the left side of the lollipop, you put the condition and what to do. So depending on this, you can make a list of the circumstances in which to do different things. Now it turned out that the only real problem was the space bar, because the space bar meant step, it meant add a space, it meant a couple of other things, and so it had an extremely intricate thing. And I worked it out completely using the, using the, um, The Mealy notation? Yeah. You, 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 well, using, using the lollipop notation. Hmm. And, and, and I, I, I heard, found the term Mealy machine much later. So a Mealy machine is, is one which has antecedents for, under given circumstances, have different antecedents and different things to do. Mm -hmm. And are you familiar with Jeff Raskin's uh, Swift system, which became the Canon Cat? I was familiar with the Canon Cat, and I liked it. Mm -hmm. He had the leap keys, so you could leap by typing like a few letters of a word, and it would find it on the page and jump right there. Uh -huh. Yeah, well, yeah. Yeah, so it's possible to take some of these ideas forward, and uh, I mean, a lot of people are thinking about it, but you need the commitment, then it would take like 15 projects working together to design like a Xanadu space. I often ask myself, if I, if, <clears throat> the, the, uh, it, what, which conference? The first conference where they were showing the Apple One. Yeah. I kept hearing, those guys from Apple want you to come down and see it. I, st I said, does it have lower case? They said, no. No. <laughs> I said, D -d -d I didn't bother. And, and, and I often wondered whether I would have been the Raskin or whether Jobs would have cut my throat and <laughs> right away the way they did. Yeah. Yeah. Well, we have Jot running on an Apple IIc in the exhibit area. How about that? <laughs> well, thank you. Jot running on an Apple IIc. Yeah, that's the small, compact, the, the precursor to laptops. And, and it does have lowercase. I don't remember the Apple IIc, but... Mm -hmm. Oh, okay. Thank you so much.